Several weeks ago, I listened to a lady talk about her experiences with her child. And even though her child was now in his 40s, he was still like a child. You see, mentally and physically, he just never developed normally. And it was very, very difficult for her and her husband rearing that child who would not mature. And sometimes people would say things. Sometimes people would have expectations. And it led to great frustrations with her. And she wanted people to know, you need to be patient with others. And so this kind of got me to thinking about how that we do need patience. And the emphasis as we study today is patience, but patience with others. Now, you can all recall times, maybe, you've been on a small two-lane road in Alabama, and maybe there's been the curve so you couldn't pass, and then there were the occasional hills, and you're behind this big truck, and he just struggles to get up the hill, and you're thinking, I want to go. Got to have patience. Or maybe you're someplace, and yes, you've got to wait your turn. And maybe there's a long line and you're just kind of fidgeting and fidgeting. For me, my last trying of patience was not any Creek Youth Camp, but it was kind of happened while we were there. We were on our way up, had some rain, and I realized my wiper's torn. And it was torn badly. And so I used them as little as possible, knowing I've got to get this replaced. So Monday afternoon, when we had a lull with camp activities, Tish and I went over to Jasper, Alabama, to get some new wipers. Well, I asked her if she'd get on her phone and find an auto parts store. And so we went to the first one. I said the first one should have been the last one. But we went in there, and it's almost like nobody's working here. And and let me tell you about me and windshield wipers. You know, these auto parts stores will advertise, you buy them from us, and we'll put them on for you. And since it's 95 degrees out there and high humidity, I'm thinking, I'm going to let them. And so I went there, but there's nobody. I'm thinking, I can't even buy them, much less get them to put them on. So I went to the next place. And so I stayed in line, and I waited, and finally someone was there waiting on me, and the phone rang. And so she finally got off the phone. Then the phone rang again. And I walked out and went to the third place. And why did I leave the first place? Why did I leave the second place? I was impatient. I was impatient. Finally, the third place got good service. Also met a fellow at camp, and he was talking about his son. And he said, sometimes we just call him Baj. What? Sometimes we just call him Baj. Is that his name? No. He just refuses to wait for anything. And so we call him Baj. You know, Job spelled backwards. Little boy had no patience. Saw this little cartoon. It's kind of the way we are sometimes. God grant me patience. And so we're waiting. And then it's like, hurry up. Does that describe you? Sometimes I think it would describe me. And so let's consider patience and the Bible. In James chapter 5, we find several incidents of this idea of patience. He begins, be patient, therefore. Sometimes you might have heard someone say, if you see therefore, ask what is there for. Well, if you read the previous verses, why those verses have to do with those who are rich and sometimes the oppression from the rich. Just you be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. 
Then he gives an illustration. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Now I realize we're not farmers quite like maybe our forebears were. But still we understand the concept, certainly, about how you have to plant the seed. You've got to get the moisture, the rain. And then with the sun and time and more rain, finally you'll see that plant germinate. You will see it grow. You might even see the fruit, the vegetables come on the plants until one day they're ripe and ready. You've got to be patient. Then he said also, you also be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another. Brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Second example. And then in verse 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Now an interesting thing is there's two words that particularly in the King James Version are translated patience. Now most other translations have in this section that word steadfast. But in the King James and New King James you have the word endure. But yet it's still the same Greek word sometimes translated Patience. Then he says, you've heard of the steadfastness. That's that word steadfast previous that was in the King James and New King James, endure. And in the King James, it is patience. The steadfastness or patience of Job. And you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So within these few verses, you see the word patience again and again and again. And in fact, you even see two different Greek words that can be translated by this word patience. The first one is makrothumia. And if you were to say, what does it mean? You could find these as meanings, patience, endurance, constancy, steadfastness, perseverance, patience. But oftentimes, and particularly with regards to how we're looking at patience with others, these ideas are present. Forbearance, long-suffering, slowness in avenging wrongs. There you have it. There's that word. Be also patient. And then there's another word, hupomene. And here you'd read that patience is the Greek word hupomene, which is a compound word made up of two other words. Hupo, a preposition meaning under, and mone, a meno, which is a verb pertaining or meaning remain or abide. Thus the idea is to remain under or abide under difficult circumstances as when it is not possible to escape or avoid them. So kind of think of difficulties and troubles and your burden down. But you don't give up, you don't quit, you don't stop. You are steadfast, no matter the difficulties that are placed upon you. You find in the New Testament the characteristic of a man who has not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. And so you see there in James 5.11, in the King James Version, you've heard of the patience of Job. And that's that word, hupomone. Now, this word can be translated various ways. Patience, steadfastness, endurance. Patient endurance, enduring patiently in these various passages and also the various translations that you might have. Now, somebody says, okay, now how do these words differ? Hupomone is remaining under difficulties without succumbing. While macrothermia is the long endurance that does not retaliate, and all this is from Trench as Robertson's word pictures quotes it. Now go back to this passage. He says, be patient therefore. And there's three times within these verses that you would find this macrothermia word. 
And then as you continue to read, there's another time you find that macrothemia word. And then there's twice that you'd find that hupomone word. And if we would say, what's this? It's, it's this patience. Hupomone, the idea of remaining under steadfastness. Macrothemia, forbearance, long-suffering. And even the idea with others, not retaliating. Now there's times that you'll find these, both these words. For instance, 2 Timothy 3.10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience... My love, my steadfastness. Here you find both those words translated once by patience. The second time you'd find it steadfastness. And Paul is saying, this is the way I've been. You followed this example. He was an example of patience. And I think we could also conclude, let us then be an example of patience. Another time we find both these words in the same verse is Colossians 1.11. He says, May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. You have those two words translated by endurance and patience. So Paul's prayer and desire for the Colossian brethren, here it is, that they would have patience and endurance. And his desire, yes, even for us, is endurance and patience. Austin Graves was a member here until his passing just a very few years ago. And Wilma was telling me that sometimes as he was suffering with a cancer, and it was a terminal cancer, that he would just sit there and be silent. And she said one time she asked him, Dad, what are you thinking? And here he was facing death. And yet he says he's thinking about why do people treat each other like they do? And that's really the heart of this lesson today with patience. We're not so much talking about we remain steadfast under all the burdens and trials. It's rather this idea of forbearance, long-suffering, where we refuse to retaliate patience with others. And I have an idea that if everyone were always patient with others, he wouldn't have had to wonder, why do people treat each other like they do? We need patience with others. And we'll just say this for several reasons. First of all, to be like God. You find the patience of God spoken of in various places. One place more specific, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, but I... Receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Well, Paul was, as he put it, the chief of sinners. And we might conclude, well, if Jesus would forgive him, the chief of sinners... If he's demonstrated such mercy and patience towards Paul, why surely he will also demonstrate his mercy and patience towards me. But in the process of just speaking of this mercy and patience of Jesus Christ towards Paul, we see then the mercy and patience of Jesus. So yes, God was patient with us. So let us be like God in this Patient with others. Another passage that you're more familiar with, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, 
but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is patient. And one of the reasons He's patient toward us, not willing that we should perish. And think of the many opportunities that He gives man day to day to day to change his life and obey Him and come into a relationship with Him and have his sins forgiven. God is patient. You know, so once again, we'd have to say, okay, God's been patient with us. Let us be like God in this, patient with others. Sometimes we'll talk about being godly or godlike. I don't oftentimes hear people say, well, to be godlike, you must be patient. We usually think of so many different characteristics. The reality is, yes, if you're going to be like God, one thing on the list, being patient with others. An illustration of this could be found in that parable of the unmerciful servant that you read of in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 23. In that particular story, you find that Jesus is illustrating forgiveness. He's illustrating that quality of mercy. He speaks of how a king was going to settle his accounts with his servants. And he goes to one, and it says, who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I know that we don't go around talking about a talent with regards to money. And so we, we kind of don't understand how much money that is. Well, think of a lot. Now, double it. Now, quadruple it. If you can get where I'm going, this was an extraordinary debt. In fact, of people who would give an amount of money in dollars, one person I saw said this was $52,800,000. Then another person said, no, today, in terms of our dollars, it's $2.5 billion. He had an extraordinary debt. And it says in verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees imploring him. Because you see, he was going to be sold, his wife sold, his children sold, all his possessions sold to begin to pay the debt. Fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me. That is, be long-suffering. Endure with me. Don't retaliate against me. And I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. Now in contrast, the person that said that the big debt was 52800000 said, now this was just $44 that the man owed him. The one who had said, well, it was two and a half billion dollars that this first man owed. Then was saying it's just four thousand dollars that this other man owed him. So quite a contrast of debts. One had already begged, be patient. And he was forgiven his debt. And now he goes to the man who owes him so little. Chokes him saying, pay what you owe. Verse 29, so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. You see, there's that patient word again. He refused and went out and put him in prison till he should pay the debt. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Like I said, this was in the context of forgiveness. But in the context of forgiveness, twice he mentions this idea of patience. Establishing again God's patience and how God's patience does lead to his forgiveness. And we'd have to conclude and say again, you know, if we're going to be godly and God is patient toward us, surely we ought to be patient towards others. 
So yes, we need to be patient to be like God. Second, we need to be patient because, well, to obey what God commands and expects, we must be patient. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, he said, With all humility and gentleness with patience, forbearing with one another in love. Now, the context here is about unity. And how can these brethren at Ephesus achieve unity? And here he speaks of the attitude that each person is to have with the other. Humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another. This is humility and gentleness with one another. Patience with one another. And bearing with one another. And it's going to take this to have the unity. But in the process, it's kind of clear. The instruction of God is that we are to be patient with one another. And if we're going to obey what God commands and expects, we're going to have to be patient with one another. Third, we need patience with others to practice what God says about love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, you have the necessity of love. Verses 4 through 7, the characteristics of love. And one of those characteristics, love is patient. Love is patient. If we're going to love, we must be patient. And then next, we need to be patient with others to give our brothers what they need. And yes, every one of us needs patience. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. He says, and we urge you, brothers... Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and then be patient with them all. Now he names the idle, the faint-hearted, and the weak. And there's specific instruction concerning each, but then now you be patient with them all. Now concerning these who are idle, if you were to take First and Second Thessalonians and consider the idle people throughout both, I think you will see the patience of Paul as he instructs the brethren at Thessalonica. Now, I know someone might raise their hand, wait, 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 preacher. I get over to 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, and I read that he's saying, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. And that disorderly is this word idle right here. So he's saying, you get to a point and you withdraw fellowship from them. Where's that patience? Let me tell you where that patience is. If you were to consider all that's said about this, you find that Paul says, now when I was with you, I taught you that you were to work. And oh, by the way, when I was with you, I gave you an example of working. And oh, by the way, in 1 Thessalonians, I instructed you to work. And oh, by the way, I told my brethren there at Thessalonica that you are to admonish, warn the idol, and not only that, be patient with them. And so when he finally got to a point in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, withdraw yourselves, that wasn't a snap decision. But it was the final exhaustion of all patience. They had been instructed when Paul was present. He had given them an example. He had instructed them in 1 Thessalonians. He had said, brethren, you warn these folks, admonish them, and be patient with them. Yes, even though we see a withdraw yourselves, I see this idea of patience. And how many of you would want somebody just immediately cut you off? Turn away from you. Reject you. No, none of us want that. And it shouldn't be that way. We are to be patient with them all. And next, we need to be patient with others to practice the golden rule. You find in Matthew 7, 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And oh, by the way, don't you want others to be patient towards you? I think we'd all have to say yes. So 
So be patient towards others. And then lastly, we need to be patient with others to keep ourselves from doing something that we will regret later. And I went ahead and put me and I because that's reality. I, I better be patient or I'll do something that I will regret later. And I'd like to say to you that I've never done that, but I have. Say, I haven't always practiced Proverbs 14, 29. Whoever is slow to anger, one translation says patient, has great understanding. But he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. And by the way, one opposite of patience would be a hasty temper. There was a time many, many years ago, Sunday morning, and you know various things can be commented uh, as you leave the building. And this time, the comment was not very nice. Certainly not complimentary. Frankly, it didn't seem like the best of attitudes was present. And it hit me wrong. And so I responded. What I said, I don't even remember. And I don't even remember what was said to me. But I do remember this. I didn't like what I said, nor the way I said it. In fact, so much so I didn't like what I said, and I didn't like the way I said it. That afternoon before we had a chance to come back for Sunday night, I called up that person, went to his house, and I said, I'm sorry. Now, I'll admit to you, I could have said, well, I was provoked. Well, I kind of was. But if you don't remember anything else from today's lesson, remember this. And this doesn't exactly have to do with patience. You cannot control what someone else thinks or what they do or what they say. But you can control what you think and what you say and what you do. And you see, that applied to that occasion. He might have spoke out of turn. He might have said something in the way he shouldn't. I can't control that. But I can control my response. And I wasn't happy with my response that day. But if I had practiced patience... That day, I would not have had to go see him that afternoon. I think that you've all experienced times, like I have. Without patience, you said or did something that you regretted. Maybe it was with your wife. Did you demean her? Maybe it was with your husband. Did you nag him? Maybe it was with your children. Did you become the fuss bucket? Maybe it was with your coworker. Were you complaining? Or was it with your boss? Were you rude? We need patience to keep us from doing something that we will later regret. We need patience with others. You know, if God had said nothing about it, common sense would have said, yes, we need to be patient with others. But the Bible has something to say about it. Let's be patient with others. We can be so thankful that God is patient with us, not willing that any should perish. It's the case that, yes, God's given man opportunity after opportunity but because of our sin, there's a final price to be paid if we would not turn away from those sins. And I pray that you today would recognize, I want God's salvation. I want His forgiveness. I believe in God. And I believe in His Son. I believe in a heaven. I believe in a hell. I believe in the Bible. And I want to obey God to please Him. I want to turn away from my sins. And I want heaven in the end. 
God's made that possible by His mercy, by His grace. We must respond. He's willing to forgive. It's as if it's prepared and ready for the taking. We must, must respond in faith, turning from our sins, to confess that faith and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And what a great promise then that we have. Yes, we're forgiven. We're added to His church. Become a part of His people. And then we have that heaven to look forward to in the end. If we could assist you in your obedience this morning, if there's a need for confession and prayer, if there's a need for prayer, for difficulties you faced, we'd be glad to pray for you. If you need to come,